Well, welcome everyone. I appreciate folks coming out today since we have a, a little bit of a blustery day across our campuses, but it really is my pleasure to welcome all of you here today across our campus locations. As you know, for the University of North Georgia, one of the things that is a founding assumption for our institution is our grounding in core values that really uh, inform our actions within the campus as well as our interactions with those outside it. And so it's a particular pleasure for us as an institution to host a series of events highlighting some of the work that the chancellor had asked for us for all of the institutions to look at this year, and that's looking at creating an ethical culture within our institutions as part of the programming for this fall. So we're thrilled to have the opportunity to focus on this topic, and I'd now like to introduce Rose Proctor, who will introduce our speaker. Rose? So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much again for being here. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for, for this afternoon, Dr. William Tierney. He's the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Affairs and University Professor and Wilbur Kiefer Professor of Higher Education at Rosier School of Education at the University of South California. He's also the co-director of the Polia Center of Higher Education. He's an expert on higher education policy analysis, governance, and administration. Cultural leadership in higher education, decision making in higher education, faculty reward structures, as well as organizational cultures. He holds his PhD from Stanford University, as well as his MED from Harvard University. And some of his recent publications around culture and, and higher education have been publications examining the cultural conditions of academic work, and also building the responsive campus, creating high performance colleges and universities. So without further ado, we are very grateful for his travel from South California to beautiful Dahlonega today. Um, wish we would have better weather for you, Dr. Tierney, but without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. I, uh, I normally say at a time like this that I like to bring the sun to where I am since it's raining, but we're in the midst of the worst drought we've ever had in Southern California, so actually I want to bring the rain back to, to Los Angeles. It hasn't rained since last March. Yeah. So it really is the worst drought we've ever had. Now I'd like to engage in a conversation today um, about a variety of things. And in my own sense, we're not um, on the cusp of change. We're involved in it right now. It's not that it's going to happen at some point. It's happening right now. So the questions to me are how are we going to innovate because the, opposite, the concern is if we don't have a culture of innovation, we're going to have a lot of challenges. But at the same time, we need to remain true to who we are. That means we need to understand innovation and we also need to understand the culture of an organization, what we are about. Now, if I first then, I want to outline what I mean by innovation and then I'd like to talk a little bit about organizational culture. And then I have some questions for you before questions for me. Let me uh, give a couple points that I've just picked up this morning that might be germane to what I've heard about what's going on at the University of North Georgia. Um, one is that, uh, as you well know, hopefully, at USC, um, we are the Trojans. And um, when I arrived there 20 years ago, uh, there was this thing that I thought at the time was sort of hokey because if you are a Trojan, you are a member of the Trojan family. And as we all know, if you're in the family, you can never get out of it. You're there forever. And I thought it was kind of silly, but the reality is there is a tremendous amount of school spirit throughout our campuses. And I learned very fast, I was president of the faculty senate at one point, I learned very fast that I'm on the University Park campus. We have a medical campus that's across town, and in Los Angeles, that's no small thing to say. It could be a 10-minute drive. It could be a two-hour drive, depending on the, the 10. Um, and then we have three smaller campuses that are mixtures of research institutes as well as specific programs that we offer. Uh, and I remember saying at one point early on, 
to a faculty member who taught at the medical campus, I, I said, oh yeah, you should come on over and we can have lunch on the main campus. And the guy was very quick to say, uh, we don't say that. You're at the University Park campus, you're not at the main campus, because we're all Trojans. And again, at the, when I first arrived 20 years ago, I thought that was kind of silly. But over time, you really do get this sense of being a member of the Trojan family. And it comes from the board and the president, but it really is as much with the janitors and the staff, because we have a, a policy at SC, which is a you know, distinctive, hard to get into institution, that if you are a staff member, so it could be the janitor, and your son or daughter gets admitted to the university, they, they get a free ride, which is no small peanuts for somebody who's, you know, it's cost $50,000 to go. Also, before I was at Penn, uh, uh, SC, I was at Penn State, and Penn State, I mentioned uh, this morning to someone that we have this interesting history at Penn State that in, in the early 20th century, the governor said, we are not going to have two-year campuses on our, in our state. If we're going to have universities, we're going to have four-year institutions. I don't like two-year campuses. And the president at Penn State said, fight on. Of course, he wouldn't say that. That's what we say at USC. But he said, that's a great idea. And then he then ran around the state and created 22 two-year campuses that were, so if you're in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, you go to Wilkes-Barre for two years and then you move to Happy Valley um, State College, Pennsylvania. And again, the, the statement there is, if you've ever been to a Penn State game, is we are Penn State. And it's, it is remarkable that I can be anywhere in the country and I can, you know, when I was at Penn State and I would wear a, a Penn State t-shirt somewhere that I would be walking somewhere and I would hear this, we are, and you have to say Penn State because who cares if you're from Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, or, or uh, uh, Harrisburg, you're a member of Penn State's institution. Now, let me just give you two seconds on myself uh, just so you understand where I'm coming from. Undergraduate degree at Tufts University in Boston, majored in English, went in the Peace Corps for two years, worked in Morocco, came, very different country for a middle class kid, came back, picked up a degree at Harvard, worked for two years on a Native American reservation at a community college um, that was tribally controlled community college. Went to Penn State, got tenure there, got a Fulbright, went for a year to Central America where I uh, tried to understand what, how do we define quality in, in Central America? And that's a question that I always want to ask ourselves in terms of who are our benchmarks? Who do we think about in terms of that we are good or not good or we need to, to get better about? Uh, left Penn State, went to USC, had a Fulbright, another Fulbright to Australia, spent six months in Australia, came back, had another Fulbright, was a scholar in residence at Malaysia. Now, when I went, I don't like to drive either. So when I went from Happy Valley to Los Angeles, everyone couldn't believe because the, the, cha the cultural change moving from State College, Pennsylvania, where at 5 o'clock we talked about rush minute, to Los Angeles where rush hour extends from about 3.30 till about 8.30 at night was dramatic. But it was also, it could not be more different for me to move from a public university to a private university. And again, I was at the time, I was a tenured faculty member and how I spend my life in some respects has remained the same. I do teaching, I do research. But Rose mentioned I'm, I'm the co-director of the Pullius Center. I started the Pullius Center. Pullius was a, a rich guy, a, a donor who was an instructor, actually a faculty member at USC. One thing I learned is if you move to Los Angeles at the right time in the 1960s, even if you were a faculty member and you bought land, you became a millionaire. And Dr. Pullius passed away, gave the money to his son. I ended up talking a great deal with Dr. Pullius's son, Calvin. Calvin passed away. Five million dollars went to me to, be, to turn it into the Pullius Center. When I was a graduate student, nobody ever talked to me about you're going to be courting donors. I didn't even know what the term meant. And I say that because to, you know, 
to stay the same, to be a faculty member, we also have to embrace change. We have to think about how are we going to do things. Um, I should also say that um, as a faculty member, academic freedom is something that remains key to my being in terms of what I'm concerned about. I also have a concern about access and equity. I'm very concerned about how do we get more low-income first-generation kids into college. And one of the things um, that, that has grown with me about that is that I realize the kinds of programs that I have, I have a mentoring program, I've got a writing program, that I couldn't scale them up. That I could say, this is a great thing to do, but if I wanted to bring it to North Georgia, I'd have to find somebody to do it, and then we rely on volunteers. <clears throat> and at the time, I thought, I wonder if it's possible to create some type of game, technological game, that could supplant or supplement what goes on in high school. And I went to the provost at the time, who has become president at the university. He gave me some seed funding. And he said to me, um, that's a great idea. But you don't know anything about technology. He knows me very well. And in fact, I don't like technology. He said, so you know a lot about content, but you know nothing about games. So if I'm going to give you this money, you have to work with the Game Innovation Lab in the School of Cinema, which I did. To jump forward four years, we attracted a fair amount of money from the federal government and foundations. We had a spin-off company. And again, I mentioned this morning that when we spun this company off, people kept saying to me, you need a business plan. And I heard that enough. I have two older brothers, and one of them is a teacher. The other one is very rich. He's a venture capitalist. And I called my brother, and I said, Paul, what's a business plan? Because I don't, I have my PhD in education. And he said, boy, you are not the guy to create a business plan. But if I wanted to succeed, I had to figure out what that was, and I had to work with people that spun off the company that we now have. Now, on top of that, just yesterday, pleasantly, there was a, a front page ad, in the second sec front page article in the second section of the LA Times about this program, because we just got five million dollars from the federal government and a foundation to make this available to seven thousand students in California. Now, again, nobody ever told me when I was a graduate student that I would be working with newspaper reporters or writing op-eds or putting things in something called the Huffington Post. And it's because I've had to adapt, and adapt in ways that I'm not very comfortable with, because I don't really like technology. I was joking with Rose that when, when I do these sorts of things, my staff always calls ahead and say, please have things set up because he doesn't know how to do this. I can press a button, however. So this, this quote here is, to talk about what the university is about. And this is a quote by Cardinal Newman in, in the 19th century. Cardinal Newman's book, The Idea of a University, is perhaps the best read book about higher education that's ever been written. And you know, what's the purpose of a university? What we're doing and for whom is really central? This is again Cardinal Newman. Um, Jose Ortega y Gasset, 70 years ago, said the same thing in terms of the mission of the institution, how important it was to define what we're doing, or he said, if we don't, it's love's labor's lost, whatever we, it is that we do. So when we define we, our mission, we need to think not only of research and teaching, but who we will teach. Now, these are two friends of mine. Zaki and Robbie, these are biracial children of my colleagues Darnell and Shafika. And you can see that they already have chosen to be Trojans at USC. So I want to talk now about innovation and what I mean by that. One of my colleagues at the University of Southern California is fond of saying that universities are places where good ideas go to die. That Perhaps we get a research grant, perhaps we develop a great idea in a classroom, perhaps we do research with a colleague or a student, we discover something, we think an idea, we might write it up, and then we move on to something else, and that idea is gone. And I don't think that's uh, good anymore, that, that really what we need to do is we need to 
embrace the idea of innovation not only for ourselves but the institution itself. Some people will say he's really an innovative guy, but what does it mean for a university to be innovative? How can we as administrators, faculty, staff, how can we embrace or create or foment an innovative culture? Organizations that are set up to be productive and adhere to the status quo are different from organizations that tend to be innovative. You know, if you go to McDonald's, that McDonald's can predict pretty accurately how many Big Macs they're going to turn out in the day, in the week, in the month. And it may, you know, for those who like Big Macs, those might be just fine. But that's not an innovative organization. An innovative organization is thinking in different ways and doing different things and creating a culture of experimentation that enables us to think outside the box. Now, innovation can be supply pushed through the availability of new technologies or demand led based on societal or market needs. And the interesting thing I think about universities right now is we have both. They are supply pushed and demand pushed. Higher education has new, new technologies that are available, but society and the marketplace is also pushing for greater participation. So the status quo seems unable to deal with just keeping new, the same technologies. We can increase a little if we are concerned about the status quo, but not significantly. And I want us to think about, you know, if you look at the newspaper industry over the last 20 years, and most folks would say that in many respects the newspaper industry is a dying industry. I grew up learning how to read by reading newspapers. I love newspapers. I still get the Los Angeles Times because I'm a sports fanatic. But I, why would we think that universities are not going to face the same challenges or are facing the same challenges that the newspaper industry does? So how are we going to adapt? In California, for example, the estimate is that we should have 60,000 more students a year, every year, for the next decade, if we want to get where we go in terms of the kinds of client, the kinds of people we, the skills we need for people to work. But we don't have the seats for them. The one campus that we built in the University of California system in the last uh, 20 years cost $500 million. It took 20 years to build and it has 5,000 students on its campus. For it to be complete, we need another $500 million. This is in Merced near Yosemite. That doesn't seem to make sense to me, especially when we need 60,000 seats next year. So then it means to me that we need to think in new ways about how we deliver our systems. But there are problems. Why don't we change? What are the problems that lead us to do the same things over and over? Well, in some respects, if what worked yesterday worked, then why do I need to change today? And I'm pretty darn happy. I get very high teaching scores. So if my teaching scores are good for what I did yesterday, then why, why are you telling me that I can't do it tomorrow? Part of it is that there are weak incentives. We adopt strategies to penalize action. They tell us what not to do. But we know that to create an innovative environment, we need incentives to act. We need a culture of innovation. And innovation suggests experimentation. So let me run through what I see as seven conditions for innovation, an innovative culture. And then we can, uh, then I'll talk about culture and then we'll, we'll talk. Um, the first to me is that one challenge is to match people's skills and abilities with the needs of the organization. You want people to stretch, but to enable people to utilize their skills in an optimum manner means that we need to know individuals. Rather than adhere to rigid schedules and formulas, we need to think of different ways of enabling people to reach their capacity. The clearest example for me are my doctoral students. I only teach graduate students, and most of my work is actually training PhD students. And 
because I work one-on-one -on -one with these PhD students, I know what they're capable of, I know what they can do and I, what they can't do, my job is to challenge them and to create an environment where they will not simply do research that's normal but move towards the future, undertake studies that are creative. A second challenge is one of the curiosities of organizational life is that we assume that to reach a goal, we have to control the means of production. In an innovative organization, that's not true. And that should be specifically true in higher education. People need autonomy. Don't create environments where people work in routine fashion, that everybody needs to march to the same drummer. Create a culture where people are encouraged to control the means to reach the agreed upon goal. But having said that, if we're to enable individuals to think creatively, then the goals of the organization can't change from day to day, leader to leader. A university president, for example, who says that community involvement is important and all of a sudden everybody's trying to deal with community involvement, but then five years later we have a new president who says actually community involvement is not my agenda, working in the classroom is, creates a dysfunction. And those of us down in the trenches say, well, we're just going to hunker down and not think about these things because there'll be another president in five years' time. We want people to be invested in their environment, to care about what occurs on a daily basis because it suggests that the culture of the organization matters. In the United States, we've coined this term distinctive colleges because their basic processes are distinct they're different from other institutions. Reed College is an example. Evergreen State College up in Washington. Hampshire College in Massachusetts is a place. There are very few, but when you visit a distinctive college, you get the sense that individuals care about that organization. They care about everything in the place, not just my own little office and my own life. Now, <clears throat> I appreciate that if a culture is distinctive, it can be deeply ingrained and resistant to change. If we take that idea in isolation, then we get a stagnant culture. And again, we can't keep not changing because of tradition. Remember that I also said that we need to create an environment where we enable individuals to take risks. And if we're constantly changing goals, people become risk averse. Now, you can't avoid fiscal and temporal resources. Resources matter, and I'm not saying that we should just shower money on people. We know to say something is important, but not to provide any monetary support seems silly to me. I'm not saying that we simply throw money at a project, but we certainly can't avoid how much a task will cost. I mentioned a moment ago about the importance of incentives. Incentives point people in a direction. They tell us what is important. And another kind of resource is time. Of course, time pressures and deadlines can help. But I consulted a fair amount of number of institutions, and they can, time pressures can help us get things done. But research also shows that if people are constantly working under deadlines, they don't look for creative solutions. They just look for whatever can get done. They simply find a solution and then move on. And that's not a good culture if we're in constant state of chaos. And even work, worse, fake deadlines create a sense of cynicism and distrust. Now, let me give an example. This year at my university, a chemistry professor won the Nobel Prize. The second happiest person on campus that day was my president, who was just ecstatic that we have someone with a Nobel Prize. He had been at the university for 20 years. Now, I understand nothing about chemistry, much less computer modeling. But the culture of my university created the environment for this guy to take risks, and sometimes with risks you fail, and over time develop an amazing change that it resulted in him winning the Nobel Prize. The government and the university created the resources for him to be successful. Now, a conundrum of academic environments 
is that faculty, and I include myself in this, or I, I'm at the head of the class, are often isolates and introverts. We work alone, but we exist as a community. We have to pay careful attention to the kinds of communities we create. We need various intellectual foundations and approaches to work, different ex expertise, different thinking styles, different age levels, and rich and innovative environment. That we're not working one to the university, but we're working in some facts as a, as a team. That excitement, respect, and diversity turns out to be actually important in creating an innovative culture. Teams matter. We understand that a sense of shared vision can be exciting. And if people don't buy into that vision, then a commitment to innovation lessens. If we don't respect alternative styles or what a person brings to the team, we end up with groupthink. We know that in isolated pe culture, people will go their own way. That's the norm in the academy, and I understand why, but I really want us to encourage to think to move in the opposite direction towards being part of something that's bigger than just what I'm doing or a paycheck. We also recognize that academics are extremely good at conveying what's wrong, what doesn't work. And that's fine. It's the art of the critique. That's what, I've been, that's what I teach my graduate students. What's wrong with this argument? What's the challenge that, you know, that we can, where's the weakness in this guy's writing that we can poke holes in? But having said, said that, what we need to do is not always come up when we're talking about what's going on at the university with what's wrong and try to think about what's right. Not simply what, what, why I don't like your idea, but how can I improve on that idea and move us forward. Now, let me talk for a moment about organizational culture. If we want an ethical culture, an innovative culture, we need to think about organizational culture. And not unlike going to Morocco or Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota or Malaysia, to do that, we need to interpret what's going on. Our work environment is filled with symbolic meanings. Now, when I started to write about organizational culture, what I thought about was, if you were to ask me what's the culture of Malaysia or what's the culture of Morocco, I could give you a fair discussion and I would probably talk about the same ideas but then talk about how they articulate those ideas. What are rituals like? What's food like? What's the temporal? nature of the, of the culture, what's the religion of the place. A place like Malaysia, by the way, is fascinating. It's 50% Malay, Muslim, 35% Chinese Buddhist, and 15% Indian Hindi. So you've got a real mixing of cultures that creates a dynamic environment that, again, the prime minister is always saying can, can bring us together or tear us apart. So let me talk for a second about what are the elements of organizational culture, and then I want to ask you some questions about here, and then we can engage in a conversation. When I think of the mission of the institution, I want us to think about it in terms of aspiration. I don't, a mission of a university should not be the same from place to place to place. So what is the kind of things that we aspire to? It also needs to be clear and finite rather than broad and expansive. Because if it is defining what you are, by inference, it's also defining what you are not. And I think missions that work do that. If we simply seek to, to educate students, well, who doesn't try to educate students? How can we do that in a, in a more specific way? Let me give an example. I, um, earlier this semester, I'm on the board of King Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia. And I had never been to Saudi Arabia before, and they brought 11 of us from around the world to advise them on their strategic plan. And when you read the mission, it was certainly a distinctive mission. And it was a mission that talked about adherence to piety and God, and there was a lot of, of quite religious 
uh, wording. And the academics were not unlike me. Most of them were university presidents. Um, and we had a very interesting, very respectful conversation where we said, you know, if this were in Europe or the United States or, or Singapore, we more than likely would be talking about something about the search for truth or academic freedom or something like that. We're not saying for you to do it, but that's what we would do. And again, their mission is distinctive enough in that it defines who they are. And you want to, th and the gender inequity is also quite remarkable in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, if they want to, they, presumably they've invited us because they want to be more like the United States and Europe. So we, they need to consider that. My own university talks about the importance of the Pacific Rim. And the Pacific Rim, you know, we're in Los Angeles and we are looking to the Pacific, to Australia, Japan, China, Asia, India. And by saying that, we're not saying we could care less about Europe, but it does point us in a direction. I mentioned that when I was at USC, I, I had my first sabbatical was at in Australia, my second was in Malaysia. And I did that in part because that's what the president and the board and the faculty were saying, this is where we want to lead. And if they had said Africa or Asia or, or Europe or some other place, I might have changed my behavior in some other way. So one is, is aspirational, a second is that it's clear and finite, and a third is the benchmark. Who do you want to benchmark yourself against? You know, I mentioned earlier when I was in Central America, one of the questions that I would ask those universities is, is this a good university? I like to ask simple questions. I'm a simple man. And they would say, well, what do you mean? And I'd say, no, I'm concerned about what you mean. And they would say, well, if you're saying, is this a good university in relation to our, our other institutions in Central America, you know, we're the best. That's what we want to be. We want to be the best university in Costa Rica, in Central America, University of Costa Rica. But if you're saying in the world, we're not. And they, at that time, their aspirations were not in the world. But Saudi Arabia right now, the rankings, university rankings, if you think it's important in the United States, outside of the United States, phenomenal importance, world-class universities. And the King Abdulaziz University, more than anything else, what they want is they want to be one of the hundred top world-class universities in the world. So they're ranking themselves against USC. And that's where you need to, that's where the conversation comes in. If you're saying that, you've got to think about these other things with regard to the mission. Whoops, I'm sorry. Second is, is the environment. And the environment is how do we define this environment? A land-grant university used to mean something. It can mean that we're serving which sorts of students. The University of California, for example, is a public institution supported increasingly less, but supported by the state legislature. Now, we had, in the, during the recession, California was, had a meltdown. We're back, but the university's resources were cut so severely that they're still not close to being where they were 10 years ago. One result is that at UC Berkeley, they have opted for increasing out-of-state students. Why is that? Well, the president tried to say it was we wanted to increase diversity. But come on, we're in California. <laughs> You're not increasing. I mean, we need more Nevadans to come to Oakland, California? I don't think so. What we needed is we needed their income because they're full paying fee students. To the extent that we now have 20% of our undergraduate students at UC Berkeley from out of state. At what point, and this is the point actually, do the citizens of California say, wait a second, your environment is not the world. Your environment is California. So who, how do you define who you serve and how do you serve them? Certainly at USC, part of our environment are alums. And it's one of it's strategic because we are so concerned about uh, fundraising. 
Our president is currently involved in a $7 billion capital campaign, so every alum counts. But also, you are a member of the Trojan family, and there is something about that, that once a Trojan, always a Trojan. Um, alternatively, from the opposite end of the spectrum, St. John's College is a great books curriculum, small liberal arts college, two campuses, Annapolis, Maryland, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. Private institution, um, very particular clientele that comes to St. John's, but they're not very much involved in Santa Fe, in the, the life of Santa Fe itself. And I'm not saying they should be, I'm saying how do you define your environment as an institution? Um, and then the other three elements that I think of with regard to the culture of an organization is socialization. And when I'm, uh, if I were to do a study of the culture of a campus, one of the first groups that I would speak with are assistant professors. Because the culture of an organization is clearest for people who are brand new. And sometimes we have formal training, you know, let's, you know, the, the workshop, the orientation for the newcomer. But oftentimes, how people learn is informally. And what is it that they learn about your institution as, an, as a newcomer to your campus? What matters? What matters? What do faculty talk about? Do faculty even come to campus? You know, USC in Los Angeles, the thought that you would go to campus five days a week, you, people would say, Bill, this isn't Happy Valley. You don't come in five days a week. You stay home, you know, two days a week. If you really want to come in, you come in three days a week, but you don't do it all the time. How about students? How important are students to the discussion of the campus? How do, who do, gets involved in decision making? Is that something that is the, the um, bailiwick of the president and provost, or is it something that's jointly shared? Is the message a kickoff? Is, is the message consistent? Or do the messages come and go? Are messages something that are done in multiple venues, or is it only one formal sort of message? How do we spend our time? Do we spend our time in meetings? Or is there significant overlook, oversight of what we want? What about senior faculty? And do senior faculty walk the talk? You know, the idea of academic freedom, for example, is not academic freedom for me. If I have tenure, I'm supposed to be involved in the life of the university to ensure that academic freedom exists th throughout the institution for everybody. It's not just me. I've always said to folks that, you know, getting tenure doesn't mean, oh, terrific for me. It means increased obligations, not less. I have to work harder, not less. <clears throat> so with regard to socialization, let me give you an example of something that I found quite remarkable. Um, we have a lot of graduate programs at our university. And as you know, graduate programs are quite expensive. And we created, uh, a, this is 15 years ago now, the University Committee on Academic Review. And I used to think of it uh, at the time The Sopranos was playing on HBO. And I, I said to the provost, I think of this as the Sopranos Committee, because really the goal was to, to kill some PhD programs. It was entirely faculty run. However, it was the provost who appointed every member of the, the committee. And uh, the faculty senate was not involved. And it was, it was prominent faculty. And at one point, I served as chair of the committee. And when I talk with my friends on, on unionized campuses, they can't believe that, that, that we would allow the, the president and the provost to put a committee like this together and that they would not be involved in the, the selection of the members. The reason that was able, and I understand that entirely as member of, as president of the faculty senate a long time ago, I totally understand that. But the reason that was possible then is the trust that involved over between faculty and administration, between the president and provost and the faculty, that in effect, the faculty were saying to the administration, we're watching you, but we trust that you're making the right decisions. And that wasn't something that you just get to walk in and say, I'm a good guy. 
trust me. It was something that had been built up. Our, we've had in the 20 years that I've been there, actually forget me for a moment, for the 25 years at USC, we've had two presidents, two very successful presidents. Steve Sample first and now Max Nakias, and Max was the provost, dean of engineering, then provost, and then became president. And through that time, again, stable leadership means something if it's good. <laughs> if it's bad, it's horrible. But what we had was the ability to create the conditions for trust, and that comes to leadership. Um, now, let me ask seven questions for yourselves, and then let's talk. And the first to me is if someone were an outsider like myself, I'd be curious how you would define the culture of the organization here. Now, again, if you were to ask me that at USC, turnabout's fair play, I would say that we are an aspirational place, we're very aggressive, we're very entrepreneurial, and we're very competitive. I, in fact, I read the LA Times online this morning, and um, I'm certain, because it was in the, pay, the Los Angeles Times, that we are no longer number one in terms of out-of-state, out-of-country, international students. We had been number one in international students for 13 years. I'll bet you donuts to the dollar, the president in his Monday morning meeting is not pleased at all with that. It, he, that is, for some reason to him, that is really important. And our international students add, it's not dollars, because everybody, it's a private university, it's expensive for everybody, it's aspirational. I would also say that we are concerned about, um, in terms of number two, I would say that we are concerned about adding value to society. That we want to be thought of as an institution of, with impact. That we're not just there, but we want to create impact for our students, with our students. We want our students to go forward and make an impact on society. And we also want in our research and teaching to create an impact. Um, and then the, the, with number three, for ourselves, I would say that collaboration is darn important, that we have talked about interdisciplinarity a long time. Everybody talks about it right now, but we're beginning to walk our talk. The, the example I gave at the start of, of the president giving me some funding and saying, you don't know anything about technology. You can work with people in the School of Cinema. That was an example of the president or the provost figuring out what to do. It was someone as a senior faculty member saying, I'm going to take a risk working with people in cinema. And it turned out we also worked with people in engineering. And what you find as a faculty member in the trenches, boy, p faculty think and work very differently. So it just, it's not simply walking across campus to going to somebody else's office. It's those folks are different over there. And you have to figure out how to negotiate that. So for ourselves with number three, collaboration is important. And again, we are members of the Trojan family. Earlier this year, um, we, was, again, this was front page news, we stole 211 faculty and staff from UCLA. Imagine that, 211. And what happened was there were two senior researchers, faculty, who in the sciences, who found the environment at UCLA a little too stodgy. And we promised them a building. And with that, they brought their federal funding as well as all their other junior faculty and staff. And that's the sort of thing that we're interested in. We're interested in being entrepreneurial. There was a museum in town that, that is hit fiscal problems, and we took it over. We now own the, the Museum of Pacific Art in, in Pasadena. And again, it's something we never would have thought of 20 years ago, but we are um, we're aggressive. Events to us also are important. Uh, not only the president's Christmas party that, you know, he has like 10 of them that a thousand people go to, but all sorts of events throughout the year that celebrate, you know, you don't realize this when you first arrive, but it celebrates that we're a member of something. That we're a member of something that's bigger than simply myself doing my work. Um, the examples that em exemplify the values I've just given, and then if you recruited a newcomer, 
what would you say to socialize the person? And this was the biggest shift for me from a public university to a private. And it's, it was, if you've got a good idea, do it. I'm not going to look at roadblocks. I'm not going to look at, you know, 11 different overviews of this is the way to do things or not do things or you can't do it. It's really a culture of do it. We're not going to give you any money for it, but do it because we want things to happen. Now, there's a danger with that, with the mission, because when you are entrepreneurial, if you've got everybody running in a different direction, what holds the place together? That's why you've got to have this contradiction of, on the one hand, we're the Trojan family, but this Trojan family is running in multiple directions. Um, we, yeah, the greatest roadblock, I think, in, for USC is, uh, one is it's exhausting. I mean, it's, uh, it can be exhausting for students, for faculty, for, for administrators, that we're all working extraordinarily hard, doing things that we think that matter, but at some point you've got to take a step back. Marketplace values uh, bring particular uh, cautions and dangers that we need to deal with, that we need to always recognize what are we in conflict with. I mentioned earlier that, that part of my work, I started a business. Well, there's conflicts of interest that we need to think about in terms of this business that's outside the university making money and a faculty member within the university. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It means we need to figure out how to make sure that it's ethical and, and just. Um, and we also know that there are diverse meanings of excellence that we need to think about um, how do we define it and then how do we enact it. So why don't I stop here if any of you want to give uh, your own answers to some of these questions about your university here I'd be welcome to hear them or you can ask whatever you'd like. Yeah. Public. The UC system is you know, and the two best UCL or two best UCs are UCLA and Berkeley, and UCLA is across town with us. They're a cross town rival. We're better than them in football, but not in basketball, unfortunately. I've been to Quaker meeting. I'm very good at. at What do you do? I'm a department coordinator for management and marketing in college and business. And I'm trying to gain a better understanding of, you touched on it briefly, um, the independent contractor philosophy of faculty versus being collegial or member of a team. Um, talk a little bit about how you um, create that sense There's multiple ways to think about this, but let's talk about teaching for a minute. I mentioned again, I said this earlier today, that I, I find it strange that in eight years at Penn State, 20 years at USC, I have never had a colleague sit in one of my classes. And, but here's the thing I find that, that interesting about that is, um, I, and I was department chair, I've done a lot of different things at the university and I was department chair some years ago and I tried to implement that like a sort of the, these are the rules because I'm a, and that failed miserably. And one of the things I think that's interesting, especially now with regard to technology it's often early career faculty who know more about technology than senior faculty. And in an environment where we often have this, you know, junior faculty should be seen but not heard, this is an example where you can actually empower junior faculty to help those of us with less hair and gray that this is, you know, a way to think about things. And, the, why, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm less interested with regard to this example of evaluation 
been more than creating a culture of quality in terms of teaching. Why would we not have this all the time? And the reason is, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh my God, I'm busy enough teaching my own classes, I can't, you know, you're, now you're going to tell me I need to be in Joe's class all the time? And no, I'm not saying that. And that, that's why I think we need to think about how we can create an environment that lessens anxiety but improves quality. Is it possible that we could have a culture where I'm asking you as a faculty member to sit in someone's class twice a semester? That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying more than that. And I think normal people would go, I could probably do that. And if you, do, if you did that regularly, right, it's not this one-off thing that we do, but we did it regularly, we would begin to create a culture where we're talking about teaching. I'm less, you know, I'm le again, I'm less concerned about the rigid, we're going to evaluate, you know, only senior faculty go into assistant professor's classrooms to write a letter for their tenure file. I get that. But I'm, con I'm talking this morning, this afternoon, about culture. And if you want to create a collaborative environment, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is that we're all talking about teaching because we're all colleagues. So that's the sort of thing I would be after. I think, um, I believe in leadership, so I think that, that the role of the president is important, the role of the provost is important. And I do think, uh, I also believe in strong leadership. But strong leadership can also suggest that individuals need to be seen and heard consistently. And it's not simply, didn't you get my memo? I told you about this in September. It also means that we need to walk our talk. Um, you know, there's an example of a president uh, this semester who uh, gave back something like fifty to a hundred thousand dollars of his salary, and what he he gave that back to the board so they would they would raise the the salaries of the lowest paid people in the organization. Now that president's concerned about community. It says he's concerned about community. That's a pretty darn good example, you know, in terms of, of what he, he thinks is important. What are the values that we think are important? And let me give uh, a personal example. Uh, I, I said earlier that I'm concerned about access and equity. So I have a mentoring program, a writing program, I've gotten a lot of grants, but I also am in schools. I do mentoring, I help poor kids apply to college right now, you know, writing their essays and things. Um, actually, I've got two examples for myself. Um, about seven years ago or so, I was on vacation and I got a phone call from the provost's office, and, or yeah, the provost's office, and they said, the provost wants to talk to you. And the provost knew that I was on vacation, so that can't be good. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I did, but I didn't want to talk to the provost. So I said, well, I'm on vacation. I'll, you know, next week, I'll, I'll get back to the provost. And Friday evening, the provost called. That really can't be good on a Friday evening. And uh, the provost said, I want you to know uh, that based on the faculty recommendation and the board, that we've made you a university professor. So there are only 22 university professors at USC, so it's a big deal for a professor in, the, in a professional school like education to get that. I don't say that so much about myself. I say it that it was the president and provost, in my mind, you know, I, the quote that I had earlier in terms of symbols, 
But they were saying, this guy spends a lot of time doing community work, research-based community work. He generates a lot of money too, but he, you know, I'm, I'm out there, and we think this is important. I thought that was, I mean, obviously, I thought that was a great example. Here's another one. Uh, I like football a lot. My, you know, I was at Penn State, I'm at USC now. My two older brothers went to Notre Dame. I didn't realize when I went to USC that's not a good thing to say. You keep that, we'll just keep that amongst ourselves. That, uh, but there are a lot of violations that happen in football. And I forget even what it was, but 10 years ago, 12 years ago, USC did something that I really disagreed with on the football field. Recruiting violations or something. And a guy from the LA Times called me and quoted me. He said, who else should we talk with? And I said, well, why don't you talk to Michael, this guy who's the vice president for student affairs, who's a friend of mine. So I called the vice president and I said, just a heads up, Larry Gordon from the LA Times is going to give you a call about whatever the thing was. And the vice president went, oh my god. He said, have you cleared this with the administration? And I said, no. He said, well, we're in big trouble. He said, I can't talk to that person. You know, this has to get cleared through university, the president's office. So I went, oh, you know, and I thought, really? I, you know, so I called the provost. And I said, you know, I just talked to Michael and he's freaking out because the LA Times talked with me <clears throat> and he laughed and he said, you have tenure. You can, you can say whatever you want. He said, Michael works for me. He better not talk to that guy. And I thought that was a great delineation of, of things because he was totally fine with me saying whatever I wanted because I was a faculty member. And he was entirely clear with his staff that when you're part of the staff, the administration, you're speaking on behalf of the university with a university policy. I'm very fine with that. And I'm also very fine that somebody that high in the administration, you know, he didn't say, I have to get back to you. He just, like that, said, you can say whatever you want. And those sorts of examples really ripple out because the number of times that I've told people that, and they have said the same thing, that that's what the provost at the time, you know, acted. Words, words and symbols matter at our institution. I believe they do. What was your question? When in Saudi Arabia and other cultures, I'm curious, you know, how much tenure is American? Oh, well, in, in, yeah. In other cultures, they do. It, it's interesting. In Malaysia, for example, it's more civil service. So it's, um, you, even though, you know, these are public institutions, so, but the difference is dramatic. You are a civil employee. So the restrictions they've got in a place like Malaysia in terms of academic freedom are severe. You cannot speak out against the government or you are in big trouble. But they do have tenure. Tenure is an interesting process in, in Malaysia as well. Um, you almost, everybody almost gets tenure. But at the age, you have, there's a mandatory retirement age of 60. And the salaries are not significant enough so that you've got this real imbalance. They want to get people over 60 out so that new people can come in. But then you've got this generation of people who are in their 60s who need to find another job. Saudi Arabia, uh, th there is no concept of academic freedom at all. So um, tenure exists in terms of job security. But, and, and again, they're government employees. So it's pretty different than what we've got in the United States. <coughs> 